Good morning, everybody. My name is Jens Chapman, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Orthopedic Grand Rounds. Today's topic is a pretty small bone, and some say a very negligible bone. But uh, whenever you look at the Tour de France, several no uh, very noteworthy riders have to discontinue because they break this particular bone. It's a clavicle, or the collarbone I'm talking of, about. And uh, this is a bone that some people can say you can resect, and others uh, spend a lot of time trying to fix. Uh, a lot of people claim that you don't even have to treat it at all, that it'll just heal fine. Um, here I'm going to invite Brett Weider and uh, Steve Benershka and uh, uh, our dear friend Winston Warm to discuss the various treatment options as to when we'll do something and how we best uh, treat it. So, Brett, take the lead, please. Good morning. Thanks for showing up and tuning in to hear talk about controversies in mid-shaft clavicle fracture care. In a classic paper in 1960, Neer wrote, the clavicle as a bone is a nonconformist. What I think he meant by that is that the clavicle doesn't seem to follow the same rules that other bones do. It's the first bone to ossify, but it's the last to fuse. It's also the only bone to form by intramembranous ossification. It accounts for 5% of all fractures, uh, but despite this propensity for fracture, it generally heals pretty well with minimal intervention. For thousands of years, clavicle fractures have been treated non-operatively, and there's even some evidence that the ancient Egyptians treated them with primitive fi figure of eight braces. Hippocrates, the father of medicine himself, advocated benign neglect. Today, however, treatment is much more controversial. So in the lecture, we'll discuss the anatomy of the clavicle, mechanism of injury, clinical and radiographic evaluation, fracture classification, management options, including non-operative uh, surgical indications. And then I'll turn the mic over to Dr. Benershka to talk about ORIF with plate fixation, and Dr. Warren will follow with intramedullary fixation. We'll conclude the grand rounds with some case presentations. The clavicle is an S-shaped bone with a convex anterior border medially and a concave uh, anterior border laterally. It's cylindrical medially with a thick cortex, and it flattens out as you move more laterally, it has a very thin cortex. It functions as a strut and it connects the axial to the appendicular skeleton of the upper extremity. It provides protection to the brachial plexus and the subclavian vessels. The muscular attachments include the uh, sternocleidomastoid, which inserts superiorly and medially. The pectoralis major inserts anteromedially. The deltoid inserts anterolaterally and the trapezius inserts posterior laterally. The subclavius inserts inferiorly. In maximum abduction of the arm, the clavicle itself elevates 15 degrees. It retracts 30 degrees and rotates along its uh, posterior, uh, it rotates posterior along its longitudinal axis 30 degrees. Uh, by far and away, the most common mechanism of injury is a fall or a blow to the point of the shoulder, uh, causing axial compression of the clavicle. Less commonly, it's the result of a direct blow, such as with a seatbelt or a hockey stick. And even less commonly, it's a fragility-type fracture after a fall onto an outstretched hand. Uh, but of course, you also have the high-energy mechanisms. And I, I had to and include a motivational poster here. And this defines vigilance as always using protective gear when doing stunts, i.e. sunglasses and, and bandana. <laughs> It's an injury of young people with the highest incidence in young males less than uh, 20 years old. On clinical evaluation, you'll find that the patient holds the arm in adduction and is splinted by the contralateral extremity. The proximal fragment is prominent and it tends the skin. It's best evaluated radiographically with standard AP films and a cephalad tilt view. It's always critical to perform a thorough neurologic exam given the close proximity to the subclavian vessels and the brachial plexus. The deforming forces in a mid diaphyseal clavicle fracture are the upward pull of the sternocleidomastoid on the medial fragment. The weight of the arm pulls the lateral fragment inferiorly, and the 
fracture is shortened by the pull of the pectoralis and the latissimus. There are multiple classification schemes. Perhaps the most well-known is the almond, which breaks it down into mid, distal, and proximal thirds. Then you have the OTA, in which the clavicle is assigned the number six. 6A simple, B wedge, C complex. Uh, but with the most descriptive and the most relevant to our talk today is the Edinburgh classification, which is similar to the almond in that it breaks it down into uh, medial, midshaft, and distal, but it also subclassifies each type. So for the type 2 midshafts, you have A1, which is a non displaced fracture, A2 is angulated, B1 is a simple wedge comminution, i.e., butterfly fragment. And then B2 is the complex and segmental comminution. As I stated earlier, the mainstay treatment for years has been non-operative. And there's, in fact, over 200 different forms of immobilization that have been described over the years. The most frequently cited paper dealing with the treatment of clavicle fractures was written by Dr. Charles Neer and published in JAMA in 1960. He reviewed uh, 2,235 fractures that presented to New York Presbyterian between 1936 and 1959. Out of all those fractures, there were only 18 non-unions. And he observed that these non-unions were symptomatic. And there was increased rate of non-union with ORIF. And he concluded that ORIF was necessary only in select cases. The criticism of the study is that pediatric fractures were included. A study by Rowe, published eight years later, had similar results. He studied 565 fractures, and his non-union rate was less than 1% in the non-op group, almost 4% in the ORIF group, and his recommendations were non-operative treatment in a spica cast or a wide figure of eight wrap. Needless to say, we no longer treat clavicle fractures in spica casts. However, until recently, it was unclear whether a figure of eight brace or uh, was superior to a simple sling. A study by Anderson et al. In, published in 1987 shed some light on this. It was a prospective randomized controlled trial that showed that there was identical function and cosmetic results with figure of eight versus sling. The sling had less discomfort and fewer complications, and there was absolutely no difference in radiographic outcome. In fact, in, in both groups, the final radiographic the outcome was unchanged relative to the initial displacement. So how do we treat clavicles non-operatively today? We immobilize them for two to six weeks in a figure of eight or a sling. We allow the patient to return to light activity in four to six weeks and heavy activity in six to eight weeks. And it's important to remember that there's no way to reduce and hold fractures and that displaced fractures heal as male unions. So what is the real risk of a non-union? Up until recently, we thought it was less than 1%. But recent literature suggests that this rate is actually much higher. One such study was published in 04 by Robinson in the Edinburgh group in which they reviewed 868 clavicles treated non-operatively. They found a non-union rate of 4.5%. There was an increased risk of non-union with fracture displacement, female gender, comminution, and advanced patient age. They also came up with what's called a prognostic index, which will determine the risk of non-union. The lower curve is uh, the risk of non-union at 24 weeks, and the hatch curve is risk of non-union at 12 weeks. So for example, a 66-year-old female with a displaced comminuted diaphyseal fracture has a prognostic index of minus two. Her risk of non-union at 12 weeks is 0.8%, and at 24 weeks is around 40%. On the other hand, a 22-year-old male with a displaced non comminuted fracture has a prognostic index of minus 1. Uh, his risk of non-union at 12 weeks is 50% and less than 10% at 24 weeks. A year later, a nice study was published in JOT in which the evidence-based orthopedic trauma group meta-analyzed uh, over 2,000 non-operatively treated clavicle fractures in the literature. The rate of non-union for a mid-shaft fracture overall was 6%, and that rate jumped up to 15% for displaced fractures. Uh, they've concluded and that the risk of non-union in long-term sequelae was increased with fracture displacement, comminution, and advanced patient age. They also found that the sling was better than a figure of eight wrap. So how do these patients do clinically? We know from Nier's work that non-unions are symptomatic, but what about the male unions? 
The first study to use patient-based outcome measures was published by Hill et al. and JBJS British in 1997. They looked at uh, 242 displaced mid-diaphyseal fractures and found a 15% rate of non-union, which were universally painful. Overall, the quarter of the patients present, uh, had residual pain. 37% had decreased tolerance for overhead activity. 29% had persistent brachial plexus irritation and around half had cosmetic complaints. They concluded that initial shortening greater than two centimeters increased the risk of non-union and unsatisfactory outcome. In 06, McKee and the Toronto group used some more objective patient-based outcome measures and found that when they compared non-operatively treated diaphyseal fractures to the uninjured side, they found that motion was overall well-maintained but strength was decreased. This decrease in strength was uh, greatest in abduction endurance, which was only 67% the strength of the uninjured side. This decrease in abduction endurance was inversely proportional to the amount of shortening. They also found that there was significant disability on mean constant and dash scores. This set the stage for the landmark study published a year later, in which 132 patients were randomized uh, to either a sling or a plate, they uh, found that their constant and, uh, DASH scores were improved with ORIF at all time points, at 6, 12, 24, and 52 weeks, and that the time to union for ORIF was uh, 16 weeks versus 28 weeks in the sling. Overall, there was a higher, higher patient satisfaction with ORIF. A cadaveric study out of Japan published this year looked at the scapular kinematics with clavicular shortening and found that when the clavicle was shortened by 10%, there was a significant change in the scapula, which resulted in decreased posterior tilt and decreased external rotation. So in summary, non-displaced fractures are best treated in a, in a <coughs> sling. Rate of non-union in displaced fractures is around 15%, and these are pretty much all symptomatic. The rate of malunion in displaced fractures is around 100%, and these can have significant patient morbidity. Indications for surgery are displaced fractures with shortening, skin compromise or open fractures, neurovascular injury, floating shoulder with a displaced fracture, relative contraindications, infection, prior irradiation, overlying burns, debilitating medical conditions, poor compliance, and a sedentary lifestyle. Nowadays, we have a lot of different tools uh, to get our uh, reduction and hold uh, our fracture from uh, displacement to allow it to heal. We have multiple different kinds of plates, DCPs, recons, precontour locking plates. And there's also a bunch of different kinds of uh, IM uh, fixation, nose pins, rockwood screws, and flexible nails. So now I'll turn the mic over to Dr. Benershka to talk about plate fixation. Thanks, Brett. That was actually a really wonderful uh, introduction to this topic, which I think is uh, becoming of more interest in the last, uh, I would say, five to ten years. So we're going to talk briefly about the management of clavicle fractures with uh, plate fixation. I really can't do justice to this topic without really giving uh, credit to the co-workers I have with me at Harborview who all treat these on a regular basis. My partners actually routinely are addressing these injuries, and I believe that really without their input, this topic is really uh, underserved.